five days, 60,000 people, tear gas, rubber bullets, broken windows, police brutality, and millions of dollars in property damages. This is the Battle of Seattle, a week-long series of largely non-violent protests against the Ministerial Conference of the World Trade Organization, hosted in the birthplace of Microsoft and Amazon. They created a fertile soil for much of the pro-middle class political rhetoric of today. Trade with China cost us 3.2 million American jobs. No more NAFTA. No more NAFTA. No more NAFTA. From November 29th through December 3rd, 1999, Seattle became home to one of the largest demonstrations in modern US history. The Battle of Seattle was among the first mobilizations, internationally coordinated mainly via the internet, with 400,000 people taking part online. What in today's political climate would be an unlikely alliance, the WTO conference united under a common cause a powerful coalition of labor unions, media activists, association of churches, students, NGOs, international form and industrial workers, and anti-globalists. Fair trade, transparency, respecting democratic process, human rights, labor laws and environmental protection were among the top demands of protesters. But they didn't just demand justice for themselves, they also demanded cancellation of debt and abolition of child labor in developing countries. Protesters came from all backgrounds – young, seniors, men and women of all colors, indigenous people, workers, journalists and artists. The city of Seattle, the police and the WTO itself were all surprised by the caliber of protests. They weren't expecting such a coordinated act of civil disobedience from ordinary folks about an issue so nuanced as free trade and the World Trade Organization itself. World Trade Organization was a newly formed continuation of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade that existed since 1947. Overseeing 145 countries, the WTO's main objectives were liberalization of international trade and to promote and manage globalization of national economies around the world. The organization gave voice to multinational corporations from developed countries that allowed them to push for rules that would let them expand freely into developing nations, exploiting the benefits of less prudent labor and environmental regulations and cheap workforce. The World Trade Organization is in charge of some crucial issues that can critically impact national economies. It can set the limits on how much working conditions should improve or restrain import barriers on free trade in biotechnology and genetically modified food. Delegates are eagerly rushing to WTO meetings because the organization has the power to overrule regulations of national governments and all other international agreements and can resort to sanctions to enforce its rules. In the 1990s, US activists spread awareness that shrimp fishing is killing off endangered species of sea turtles. The Environmental Protection Agency soon adopted a regulation that all fishermen ought to use nets with escape hatches for the turtles to swim away. However, poorer countries did not adopt this rule, and shrimps from dragnet fishing could still be sold on American markets. The US Congress decided to introduce an import ban on shrimps that were caught in nets without escape hatches. However, the WTO doesn't allow import bans that are based on the ways of production. So the US government was forced to amend its own regulation to satisfy the World Trade Organization. This also happens to US import barriers on low-cost foreign steel that protected American steelworker unions. The WTO can also resolve disputes between member nations. Agriculturally exporting countries like the US, Canada or Australia saw European and Japanese subsidies to their farmers, alongside food safety and environmental regulations, as unjustifiable distortions of free trade. This is where the WTO sided with the US, essentially undermining food independence of European and Asian nations. Resolution of these disputes underlines the fact that liberalization of trade is always a priority for the World Trade Organization. The WTO is a fuel of its own opposition. Much of what's being discussed happens in secrecy of the latest circles. The organization conceals a lot of documents crucial for decision making, and the public is not allowed to comment on or attend WTO judicial hearings on trade disputes. Even from within the delegates or then US President Bill Clinton arose calls for more transparency of the talks, but nothing was materialized. The WTO is not accountable, as many of the delegates are not directly elected, but merely appointed ministers and deputies. A lot of the most important talks are even excluding majority of member states in so-called green room discussions. 
Green Room is a single committee of 25 member states, almost all of which are industrialized nations. The delegates excluded from the Green Room debates were not even told what was being discussed. This united delegates from more than 40 American and African countries, who opposed the way the talks were being held and the way they were marginalized by the rich countries. Within a day, 1,700 groups from developing nations signed a petition objecting the Green Room and sidelining of the poor. The WTO is so decidedly pushing for free trade that it makes it look like there is an academic consensus that free trade is inherently positive. It gives poor countries a competitive advantage by offering cheap workforce and lax safety regulations. Consumers in rich countries can benefit from importing cheaper goods and firms can get materials at lower costs. But then, 500,000 Indian workers demonstrated against the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, the predecessor of the WTO, to resist corporate expansion of multinationals into their country. It seems that people from countries on both ends of free trade are not so fond of the idea of economic globalization. One reason for people on the receiving end could be that a foreign corporation can easily outcompete local businesses, forcing them to take low-wage jobs instead. Rental properties lose out on disappearing middle-class enterprise that use their real estate for business. The economy becomes more vulnerable to market volatility and recessionary layoffs, as much of the economic force is concentrated within a smaller number of foreign corporations who have no national interest in the people and communities that work for them. Free trade greatly benefits rich corporations, but not so much the people in rich countries. Outsourcing of jobs costs millions of workers to go unemployed or take lower paid jobs. The economic costs do not stay confined within those workers. As they lose income, they cut spending, which in turn deprives other businesses of their profits. Whether it affects poor or rich countries, free trade causes capital to flee out of local economies into the bank accounts of multinational corporations residing in tax havens. The GDP, stock markets and CEO pays are booming, but not so much the rest of the economy. At 4 o'clock in the morning, a day before the conference opening ceremony, five activists climbed a construction crane to drop down this banner. By lunchtime, 3,500 people were already in the streets, hundreds of them dressed in turtle suits. A pro-WTO counter-demonstration was also planned, but only about 50 people showed up for that one. The following day, the protests were largely non-violent. However, a couple of dozens of young protesters, dressed in black and wearing black masks, smashed some newspaper boxes and windows in Nike stores. They were quickly chased away by peaceful protesters, while others chanted, no violence, no violence. Yeah, take off the mask! Take off your f***ing mask and join the rest of us and shut up! By 10 a.m., the streets of Seattle are filled with 25,000 protesters. Many of them stage sit-ins and chain themselves together, thus blocking intersections between hotels and conference buildings. This prevents delegates from attending WTO functions. By noon, the opening ceremony is cancelled and protesters claim a major victory. At this time, up to 100 rioters in black clothing and masks smash windows of several retail stores, Bank of America and McDonald's. Crowds of peaceful protesters stand between the stores and the violent rioters to prevent them from smashing windows. The police standing 100 yards away doesn't do anything against the rioters. Several police officers have told us because they were assigned to control the protest crowds, they weren't allowed to break ranks and to stop the black block. So the group just continued destroying property for nearly an hour. Instead, they heavily used pepper spray and tear gas against nonviolent protesters who engage in peaceful sit-ins. By 3 p.m., Seattle police runs out of department-issued pepper spray. When President Clinton threatens the mayor of Seattle, Paul Schell, to shut down the whole conference unless the city is cleared, the mayor declares a state of emergency and a curfew from dusk till dawn in the downtown area. The city of Seattle calls in state patrol troops and National Guard for help. The next morning, December 1st, the mayor announces a ban on gas masks without exemptions. It takes the mayor several hours to exclude firefighters and journalists from this ban. However, reports of police brutality began piling up. Police brutality. 
am not struggling at all. I am not struggling. I am peaceful. Remove your knee Move from back. my neck. I saw uh, circumstances that are in fact troubling to me. The police is ordered to arrest everybody in their way and people are being chased down into the residential areas of Seattle. We are residents! There was no protesters! None of us are protesters here! Even bystanders and journalists who are not participating in the protests are arrested. Dozens of people are taken to hospitals for injuries. By the end of the day, 600 people end up in county jail. The following two days saw the focus of demonstrations shift from the WTO to Seattle police, where protesters demanded the release of all arrested demonstrators. Let them go! Let them go! Let them go! On December 3rd, the US Trade Representative, Charlene Barshevsky, and WTO Director General Mike Moore suspend the conference, citing street actions as well as insider disagreements among the delegations. If you were to turn on your TV and watch the events in Seattle on the news, you would see images of a familiar city turned into a war zone by violent rioters and police struggling to disperse the crowds. You wouldn't be given a correct chronology of the events, that the police began using tear gas and pepper spray on peaceful protesters before any violence even occurred, that a police force was firing rubber bullets and threw flash and concussion grenades into the crowds of non-violent marchers and that the violence was in fact mostly confined within small groups of rioters who called themselves black bloc or brick throwers and who were mostly female in their late teens and early 20s. For them, vandalizing private property and spraying anarchist symbols was not seen as an act of violence. Looters took advantage of a disrupted city, yet the police took little to no action against their purely criminal and apolitical actions. But for the peaceful demonstrators, sending a message of non-violent civil disobedience was of uttermost importance. Most news cycles described demonstrations as anti-trade, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Seattle was built on trade, and most people realized that. We're not against world trade, the rules of world trade, we're against world trade without rules. The real demands were fair and green trade, giving international markets oversight so that corporations cannot exploit children or workers in countries with poor labor conditions. We've got to have better labor standards and we've got to make sure that labor and environmentalists have a seat at the table. They demanded that the WTO should respect rules and regulations of local governments and should not try to force free trade at the cost of democratic process. Part of the demonstrations were also teachings and info sessions, educating people about the issue of global trade and the WTO. Some delegates went out into the streets to meet with the protesters and engage in open discussions, and they were surprised by how well informed the people were about these issues. The Battle of Seattle resulted in $20 million in property damages and lost sales. US taxpayers had to cover additional $3 million for city cleanups and police overtime. The city of Seattle had to pay $250,000 to 157 protesters for violating their Fourth Amendment rights. The chief of Seattle police, Norm Stamper, took full responsibility for failing to secure the streets from violence and he resigned shortly afterwards. Today, whole 20 years later, the courageous demonstrations in Seattle are barely in our vague memory. No WTO conference was ever hosted on the US soil again. But the World Trade Organization can still overrule decision-making of 200 countries across the globe with virtually no oversight and transparency. The legacy of the Battle of Seattle is needed now more than ever.